Here is a human. Here is a human. Here is a human in the times of a pandemic. The human came from outside. She must prepare to be inside. She takes off the mask. What shall she do next? A perfect human is careful. A perfect human is careful. A perfect human is careful. What shall she do next? Hello, my name is Maya Elizabeth Sorensen and I'm from Denmark. Uh, hello, my name is Kristina Dagurova and I'm from Russia. We're both Amsterdam-based filmmakers and both part of Golip, which is an artist collective based in uh, Amsterdam New West. And we are here today to talk a bit about our research and movement within the cinematic frame. Um, yeah, we will share a little bit about our own practices and uh, we will talk about uh, um, a short film that uh, we've made together and that was the first time collaboration. It is called uh, How to be a Perfect Human. And uh, yeah, it's a short experimental film. Yeah. Thank you, OT, for, oh, yeah. <laughs> for hosting us. Very important. Uh, yeah, but... Uh, Let's get started with a little bit of background from our practices. Uh, yeah, I can go first. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so in general, uh, my focus in uh, filmmaking and in art project is around uh, body memory and uh, body language. And I'm always curious how to, how a story can be told only with movement or how can a narrative be built only around movement. And uh, my previous film is called uh, Listen to the Grass Grow. And actually it's, um, it's a childhood memory of the main character, but uh, she's trying to let her body tell this memory. So in general, it is a physical performance that is going on in front of the camera. And uh, uh, we can actually see the trailer of the film. It's gonna be the clip number one. У меня всегда была хорошая память. Я в это верю.
Yes, yeah, so in uh, in general, I believe that our body remembers um, much more than our brain does. So I'm always trying to find different ways in order how it can we let our body speak. Yeah, well, like Christina, I'm also interested in body language and uh, nonverbal communication. Uh, I have a background in dance and choreography, so when I started working with the film medium about 15 years ago, it was very natural for me to make dance films. Um, so where the choreography of movement is the core of the film, and a little bit like you, Christina, I was working with uh, building the narrative from movement. Uh, I want to share a, a short clip. It's an excerpt from a film called Satellite that I made in 2013. And basically you have uh, in the film, there's three different characters um, placed in different spaces. And from their different uh, spaces, they're trying to communicate with each other through abstract movement across time and space. Um, yeah. A little bit like actually how it feels like living in the COVID times. So uh, let's let's play uh, the next clip. So over the past years, my practice have kind of moved into a new direction. Whereas um, when I started, uh, the focus, my focus was on the actual movement. And now I've become more interested in the person moving. Um, how does she move? How, what does her body language tell about her? What does the gestures uh, suggest? And how does she place herself in her surroundings? And how does she relate to others? So when the pandemic started, I got very curious on how that's going to affect uh, affect us with uh, all these new restrictions and like all this, especially the distance. And we were const constantly bombarded with this, like, keep the distance, keep the distance. Like, how will that affect uh, our bodies and our relationship with others? Yeah, true, because actually what you're saying, like this distance thing, it's not about how far from each other are we, but also like with all these uh, new movement patterns that uh, the body is creating space, like for example, how people are moving around in the supermarkets with the cart. It's, yeah, it just uh, it just changed the whole like movement in a, in a space of a body. True, but I, I do think it also relates to how we're relating to each other. I do miss hugging people, I have to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's true. I mean, the pandemic changed a lot. Um, and uh, I was I was thinking that, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's already in my body, you know, like especially when the lockdown started like this, these restrictions, they just turn into a everyday mantra, like keep your distance, wash your hands, cough in your elbow, don't shake hands with people, wash your hands again. And then I'm also like, I'm doing these things already automatically. So they, they got into my body system and uh, I started to think about, okay, but we will pass pandemic one day eventually, but I started to understand that it will stay in my body for longer. Yeah. So like everyone else, like the pandemic, we were deeply affected by the pandemic, like all this anxiety and the uncertainty. And then it was like, it just seemed like a natural thing to cope with that by reflecting on it through our practices. 
And then since we have very similar interests, it felt both uh, natural and exciting to, to get together and reflect together. Yeah, and actually, if you go back to the beginning, uh, we simply started with uh, brainstorming, um, just collecting an archive of uh, all the situations and all the details that we are struggling the most with during the lockdown with all these restrictions. And uh, actually, this, um, uh, this, earn this turned into a selection of scenes, and that led us to a selection of a collection of objects that we used in the film, those objects that are the most crucial uh, on our way of uh, living a normal life again, like, yeah, the sanitizer, the napkins, the key, cell phone, the trash mask, mask trash bin. So yeah, and uh, instead of uh, writing a script, we were just uh, collecting these scenes into a coherent narrative by physically trying them out, by doing it each scenes one by one, and then we were just filming each other from a side just to see how it looks. And how it works and how it feels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the story is basically following a woman through her daily routine. She gets ready to go outside. Um, she goes grocery shopping. She comes back inside. She prepares a dinner. She has friends over for dinner. And then she has a party with her friends. And I think it's time that we show a little clip from the work. Yeah. A perfect human can move. A perfect human can move outside. Here are boundaries. Here are boundaries. A perfect human is careful. A perfect human cares about others. So some of you might recognize the style a bit um, because uh, when we started brainstorming, um, we started to, uh, we were thinking about uh, a short film from 1967 called The Perfect Human by Jürgen Leth. Um, and yeah, basically that short film is uh, depicting what a perfect human does and by watching it, rewatching it, and uh, putting it into our brainstorm, uh, it kind of articulated our questions. Um, what does it mean to be human in the times of pandemic? And what does it mean to be perfect now? Um, so for those of you who have seen uh, Jorgen Let's film, you might really recognize the style. Um, it's very minimalistic. It's set in a, a white studio space. There is a voiceover uh, describing what the man and woman on screen is, is doing and performing. Um, and what else is there to say about the film? The minimalistic style? Yeah, yeah. it's black and white. It's black and white. Yeah. So we, we kind of held on to, to, uh, to that style. Um, to kind of make a sort of a, a response to yeah. this film, yeah. But also it was a way to kind of strip away like all of the things that are not necessary for the story. So in the end, all we had left was COVID and everything evolving just around that. Yeah, and also like this, um, this uh, form, this minimalism also led us to some uh, artistic choices inside the film, for instance, like the sound design because um, 
yeah, let's say it's almost a silent movie, but there are sounds that are connected to the objects, uh, which, yeah, which I already told were very crucial for our daily routine in times of the pandemic. And um, yeah, so y we keep this uh, Jorgen Leth inspiration as a, as a form, but also it was our freely response to him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, in terms of the process, you can kept, we, we kept it quite minimal. Um, we were very fortunate uh, to receive a grant, uh, the Snell Locket grant from Amsterdam Funds for the Kunst. And uh, one of the requirements was that you had to keep the COVID measurements, which means like, well, the distance. And there is a limit of how many people you can be around. Uh, and as we are part of Golip, uh, there are nine other artists working there. And they were at, during the first lockdown, they were kind of part of our social bubble anyway. So we invited them to take part um, in the creation of the work, but also some of them are performing in the film. Uh, additionally, we had, um, we had this, we don't have it anymore, but we had a beautiful, uh, big 100 square meter uh, studio available to us. Uh, in the same building and also um, in this in the same building there is a a great uh, sound technician Nick De Witt, uh, who has a studio there so we work with him as well and we just try to keep everything uh, within the building uh, and just basically stick with the the resources that we had available yeah so and in in a way it's also turned out into a like album like, yeah, like a family video about the times that we actually spent together in this pandemic bubble. Yeah, with the other artists. Yeah. But uh, shall we watch another clip? Yeah. The Let's watch another clip. Yeah, the fourth one, I think. <laughs> We call it uh, the dinner scene and actually it was based on a true story that um, I've heard from... Like, like the rest of the film. Of course, yeah, okay. it's a documentary film, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I w during the lockdown I was talking to my friend on Zoom and she was surviving the lockdown in Switzerland in the Italian part in a very tiny little village, like literally little and tiny, like two streets and three houses and um, one uh, one day they decided to have a barbecue with their neighbors and <laughs> she was telling me about how they did it and it was hilarious because of course they, they all were keeping their distance in the garden and then in order to eat together they sanitized all the cutlery, all the spoons, all the forks. They Each of them has a plastic bag with snacks like salads, fruits, tomatoes pieces whatsoever so i just imagine it like it was like the the most lonely barbecue ever like people sitting on a distance with their plastic zip bags and having trying to have a nice time so yeah and also it, it felt kind of nice because 
Yeah, everybody is struggling with this thing, but somehow everybody trying to get back to normal somehow. Yeah, within the limitations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, um, talking about based on a true story, uh, I, <laughs> I prepared a, a question to Maya. Uh, because Maya performed the, the the human in the film, the main character. So I was actually wondering, um, how did it feel for you to be this human inside of this minimalistic frame? And um, what did you bring to the character from your personal experience? Mm. Well... I think the personal experience was really put into the whole uh, pre-production, the creative process of making it and developing the scenes. I mean, we, as Christina was saying earlier, we were really performing um, the different scenes in order to figure out what they were doing. And, and through that process, I feel like that was also like a way to kind of act it out and, and, and deal with it. Um, but when it came to to filming it. Yeah, well, we, we decided to, to go with uh, this uh, very specific uh, kind of robotic uh, movement style, which was because, um, yeah, I mean, it just felt like being in a sci-fi film at the <laughs> time. So, so we went in that direction and made everything kind of artificial. Um, and yeah, so basically when I was performing it, when we got to the actual performance for the camera, um, I was very concerned of being on being accurate so it was very much about like the directions of the space the di directions how i was placing the objects and the timing and the pauses uh, and it's funny actually because i think at one point we we talked about this and there was we counted that there's only about mm -hmm. four emotional moments or reactions, because, I mean, it's very short, it's just reaction. And I think, well, there's one in the clip that you just saw from the dinner scene where um, Stefan, one of our uh, performers, is, co is coughing and everyone reacts to that. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm still reacting to coughing if I'm in the public. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Checking <laughs> who was it. Um, yeah. I was about to say something, but now I don't remember. Hmm. I'm trying to see if I can read your mind. No? No. Well, then I just move straight on because I also have a question for you. Oh, I better remember what I wanted to say. <laughs> 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 to avoid the question. Well, um, so as what you cannot see in the film is actually that there is, I mean, there is a voiceover, you hear that, but that's actually Christina performing it. Mm. And um, it's very monotone. It's just <laughs> the same tone throughout the whole film. So I am actually curious, because speaking of all of these like anxiety and the uncertainty and that that we were coping with, like, how did you deal with that within that performance? I think we did a lot of uh, takes when we were recording the voiceover. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of tricky because. Uh, yeah, actually, if if I think about it now, then uh, our character, the human, is kind of changing a little bit from the beginning towards the end of the film, because at first you see the, how confused she is and how bizarre the whole situation around her is for her. But towards the end, she's getting more into this robotic monotone, like algorithm. And I think the opposite thing is happening to the voiceover because first the voiceover is kind of guiding her through the situation like basically telling her what to do and towards the end the voiceover was changing into questioning like okay we can do this but why and actually this is nice if we think about like this so they are they are evolving in a different ways but of course it's uh, yeah it's hard to to be monotone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did it excellently. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. But actually, I think it was also a nice experience to everybody who was part of the cast. 
because I remember we talked uh, after the shooting with uh, the guys who performed about their experience and um, of course they are, they all are artists but um, and they do performances sometimes but they are not professional actors and we asked them like what did you feel guys and I think it was Stefan actually who told that well basically I, I wasn't doing anything extraordinary I was just living my life and all the actions were super normal and and natural like yeah the way we live right now i guess we've all been programmed to this uh, yeah, true COVID times yeah yeah and maybe it's time also to talk about the image the camera work yes because this is um, also that was also very important for us and um uh we worked with uh, daniel donato with our very good friend and actually he picked up very well the Jorgen Leth style. So the the picture kind of looked from the late 60s, also because it's a black and white texture, but Daniel managed to make it look m modern, right? Yeah, I think that he really kind of, he got the concept, he got the, the style, and then he just kind of ran with it and took it into a more contemporary style. Um, for some of the scenes, yeah, totally, he totally got it. And the music? The music, definitely. I mean, we work with a fabulous uh, Danish composer called Nikolai Hess, and um, basically we wanted again to stay kind of within the, the Jorgen Lett uh, universe, so we wanted to stay with uh, a clarinet. There is a clarinet playing through uh, The Perfect Human, um, and, but then of course, because, because the atmosphere of our film is different, um, we gave, uh, Nikolai some, some interesting, <laughs> uh, cues such as, uh, it had to be super unpredictable, uh, uh, in terms of rhythm and, um, timings and pace. And, uh, what else did we say? Like a it bit has of to be awkward, awkward. A little bit of omnius and then, uh, but also fun. So, and he just kind of, he got it and just put everything together and made this beautiful theme that is playing throughout um, and kind of uh, returning throughout the film. Uh, I think we are going to uh, the end of the talk. Really? Already? Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, okay, so then I have uh, another question to you, Christina, because mm -hmm. as you can probably hear, like this, this collaboration was really, I mean, we worked really closely together. Um, we co-directed the film, which is actually the first time that I co-directed anything. Yeah, for me as well, yeah. Yeah, we co-edited the film, we co-produced it. Uh, we we, we co-everything. We, we just co-everything, yeah. Uh, and uh, we're still friends. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So it worked out, and uh, we were very much in sync with the whole style, with the idea, um, and what we wanted to convey. Um, but yet, we still, at this point, have like somewhat like a different interpretation of the work. So, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about what your input? Uh, interpretation <laughs> of the what work. What do is. I think? What do I think about the film? Yeah. Um, if, yeah, uh, if we, s if we talk about that, yeah, from the beginning, from the title of the film, how, how to be a perfect human, I think, um, um, uh, I just prefer to, to leave, uh, the word perfect aside, not because I, it doesn't mean that much for me, but, uh, I would put the, ac like the accent on the world and the word perfect human because it's not that much about how to be a perfect human for me but it's more about how to stay a human in these very weird times and actually i um i i've shown the film to my parents recently <laughs> and my father told me well yeah it's cute but <laughs> <laughs> but you made a video manual and i thought well yeah, it is a video manual, even though it's ironic one. 
But the thing is that uh, looking at it as a video manual, I understand that I don't want to follow it <laughs> and I don't want to live like this. And I really want the film to 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 be as a like a footprint of the reality that once we all were living in. But I just don't want to. I, I wanted to stay on the hard drive, on the cinema screen, on the laptop screen, but I don't want it to stay in the reality. But again, knowing how the body works, I re I'm just realizing that, yeah, the pandemic uh, situation will stay in my body for some time. You just have to reprogram it once we're back in a different, yeah, hopefully, <laughs> Let's see. a freer world again. And how about you? Well, I mean, I relate to everything that you're saying. Um, and the film also means something like that to me. Uh, but um, I do, I would like to talk a little bit about the word perfect, actually, <laughs> uh, because I don't like it. Um, and I think also in the beginning uh, of the process, uh, when we were sharing this with friends and also uh, uh, the fellow artist who was uh, working with us, um, a lot of people had issues with it because um, basically like the film is about like this accuracy of how to to live, uh, to perform or to live these uh, measurements and um, to stay safe basically, to be healthy. Um, and then how does perfect play into that? But for me the word perfect is kind of taking the film into uh, the context of today outside of this COVID world because we are there is so much striving for perfection in like how we present ourselves on social media like with, uh, plastic surgery all these things uh, even plastic surgery to look like your Instagram filter um, and if you've kind of put that idea or that concept about perfection into something that has to do with a necessity, I think that the clash between the two is kind of amplifying the absurdity of the COVID times and all this that we have to go through, as well as the uh, absurdity of, of striving to be perfect. Um, but then, of course, I mean, one of the reasons why we did keep the title and we did keep the word perfect also throughout the film, it's uh, part of the voiceover. That is, of course, because we're referencing uh, The Perfect Human by Jürgen Leth. Uh, but I have to say, I'm, I'm happy that we stuck with it. Yeah, me too. And uh, maybe let's uh, tell, uh, tell the secret. That actually... It's uh, not so secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on social media. <laughs> Once it is there, it's not longer a secret. So uh, there is a chance uh, actually to watch the film because we are very happy to have the world premiere next uh, Friday at Cine Dance Festival. So it's going to be online because the whole festival goes online and yeah, you have a possibility to, to watch the film. And uh, yeah, the only thing is that it's uh, strictly for the Netherlands, so it's geo-blocked. So yeah. But <laughs> if you happen to be in Denmark and are very curious about the film, you can actually watch it because, drum roll, like we're super excited to announce that we've been selected for Copenhagen Docks, which takes place at the end of April, I think. Yeah. Um, so there is another possibility to watch the film there. And of course, we will try to to make a public screening somewhere in Amsterdam. As soon as the measurements exactly. are lifted, yeah. Um, so last, I think... Time I to just thank people. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I think I really would like to thank um, everyone who participated in the work. And yeah, and um, thank you, OT. Thanks a lot to <laughs> OT for hosting us. Yeah, stay, stay with OT because um, there is much more ahead, I've heard. Yeah, there's a nice lineup, so don't go away. Thanks for listening and have a good evening. <laughs>